Well, my name is Mel Melissa Watkins. Uh, I obviously live in Korea. I teach at a university in Chunan. Oops, whoa, okay. <laughs> I teach at a university that's about an hour south of here in Chunan. Uh, I don't teach English. I teach cultural studies and uh, a couple of other things. So I kind of tend to come at things from a slightly different perspective. I did teach English at one time. Hi, James. I did teach English at one time, so I try and kind of retrofit some of the things I'm learning teaching a subject in English to English teaching. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. I'll be really upfront with you guys. I'm not an expert. I'm not even a particularly good teacher, but I'm a very good storyteller. So what I like to do is talk a lot, okay? I like to ask you questions. I want you to ask me questions. I kind of tend to approach things from the, you know, I, I find things that I'm curious about, and I find out a little bit more about them, and then I give them to you, and then you tell me what you think, okay? So that's where I'm coming from. I'm not going to give you a lot of statistics and say, well, in the research of this guy from the year blah, blah, this is what we know, because we don't, at least I don't. So let's just sort of have a discussion, and I'll give you some interesting things I found, and we'll work from there. How's that sound? Mm -hmm. All right. Now, really quickly, I just want to get a kind of a measure of the temperature of the room. Who here? So I think you are maybe the only Korean here. Hi. Am I right? OK. Are you a teacher? OK, excellent. So you're studying teaching? Yes. OK. What level do you hope to teach? OK, middle or high school students. Good, OK. Everybody else, are you all teachers? OK, what levels do you teach? We're in middle school? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm both uh, upper elementary school and middle school. OK. High school. OK. University. OK. University. OK. Teacher okay. trainer. OK. Okay. University. All right, interesting. So we've got a good mix here. All right, so we've only got one person who's doing elementary school, which is going to be interesting. But we'll see what we get here. So today what I'm talking about is including <coughs> missing voices. Now. I'll get into what that means more in a, little, in a moment here, but I'm, I've been looking lately at enriching our classrooms with global and world Englishes, basically. Uh, before we start, I want to ask you, who speaks English? <laughs> who speaks English? Okay, not here. I know all of you speak English. If you don't, I don't know why you're here. But in the world, <laughs> generally speaking, if I say English-speaking person, what do you think? It's more than just native speaker. Mm -hmm. The first language is English. Of course, the English-speaking countries, but mm -hmm. most countries are learning it. Most countries are learning it, but you lingua think it's franca. okay. So it's a lingua franca. Okay, that's a good word for it. Yes. All right. But if I say English speaker, what comes to your mind? Who comes to your mind? American. American. Okay. England. England. Okay. You're definitely Kenyan. <laughs> 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 Who else? <laughs> Australia, okay, New all right. Zealand. New Zealand, okay, okay, all right. Wrong, no, sorry, <laughs> all right, but kind of wrong. When we talk about who speaks English right now, there's an interesting phenomenon happening in the world as it is, where the average English speaker is not a native speaker of English. I think we all know that on some level, that's why we all have jobs, yeah? <laughs> okay, right, the average person who speaks English at any level is not a native speaker. There are more non-native speakers of English and English as a foreign or second language speakers in the world than there are native English speakers. Yet, when we talk about teaching English, when we talk about people who speak English, when we look for examples of English speakers to show our students, we look at England, Australia, America. We don't look at Kenya, China, Singapore. But there are more people who speak English in Kenya, China, and Singapore than there are people who speak English in America. Interesting, right? So let's talk about that a little bit and how we can use that to our benefit to enrich our students' learning, okay? So uh, also India is up here because there are, India, in India, English is an official language and nobody ever talks about Indian English as being something important to learn. However, I don't know if those of you who teach in universities have noticed, but there is a trend now where a lot of Korean students are going to India and the Philippines to learn English and then coming, if the ones who can't afford to go to uh, Australia or the UK or America or Canada, go to India or the Philippines and come back with Indian and Filipino accents. Interesting. 
Right? Yes. I mean, I have students in my class right now. That exactly. Are, we, they come into our class. I teach it on mm -hmm. the whole mm -hmm. And uh, that's, they come to our school mm -hmm. to continue because they just came from seven, seven months in the Philippines. Exactly, exactly. But we never use examples of Filipino English in our classrooms, do we? Because there is this sort of native English hierarchy, which we'll get into in a minute, right? We have this idea that only a native English speaker can teach English in Korea. <laughs> right, that's not the case everywhere. Uh, so uh, it's interesting to be able to use a lot of these different examples. Now, uh, I want to talk about a couple of concepts. The first one is global English. I'm going to say this one a lot. You'll hear these terms a lot, and I think you're going to hear them more as we continue. Global English, world English, global Englishes, world Englishes. Those all sound like the same thing. They are not. I'm going to get into the distinction a bit. I tend to use them interchangeably because they're similar enough uh, in this context that it doesn't really um, I don't think it takes away from the meaning of what I'm saying if I say global Englishes or world Englishes, but they are actually quite different, so I'll talk about that. What I'm really talking about today is the idea of global Englishes uh, global or global English. Uh, there's this, this pair of researchers, Galloway and Rose, who are from uh, Scotland and Britain, uh, England, respectively, and they've written quite a lot about the concept of global English. Uh, they are... They've, they have a website called globalenglishes.com, which is a great resource. It's got a lot of really good pedagogy resources if you're looking at how to use global Englishes in your classroom. We'll talk about that more later, too. But there's two quotes that I pulled directly from the front page of their website that explain what it is we're talking about, I think, really well. The first is, today, non-native English speakers outnumber native English speakers, and English has become the world's foremost lingua franca, dominating the world stage in a number of domains. I told you I'm a storyteller, really quick story. One of the first people I met in Korea is a guy who works uh, for LG. And at the time, there were a lot of LG outposts and factories and things in China, or a lot of, I think they were buying components from a Chinese factory or something like that. So when I met him, he was telling me, oh yeah, I go to China two or three times a month for work. And I'm like, wow, you go to China that's so much and you work there, you must speak Chinese. And he looked at me like I needed medication and he said, no, English, <laughs> right? So even if, even I'm thinking to myself, wait, why don't you speak Chinese? Korean and, and Chinese are closer together. I guess I had assumed before I came here that because China's close, that more people in Asia would learn Chinese than English, but that is not the case. Nobody learns Chinese, everybody learns English. So when Korean businessmen go to China to work, they speak with their Chinese counterparts in English. They speak with their Japanese counterparts in English. English, and so on and so forth. So English has become the world's foremost lingua franca, but not native speaker English. I think that's an important distinction. Now, also they say global English is a paradigm that includes concepts of world Englishes, English as a lingua franca, that's E-L-F, and English as an international language, E-I-L. Now we are all teaching E-F-L, English as a foreign language, not English as a lingua franca. That's a whole other thing that we don't have time to get into right now, but this is important to think about. It examines the global consequences of English's use as a world language. Consequences is, is an interesting word, isn't it? Right? But Again, we don't have time to get into all of that unless anybody has a comment, but something to think about. In many ways, the scope of global Englishes extends the lens of world Englishes, ELF and EIL, to incorporate many peripheral issues associated with the global use of English, such as globalization, linguistic imperialism, education, language policy, and planning. That's a lot to chew on. The part that I want you to take away from this in terms of this presentation today is that as language educators, as English language educators, it is important for us to think about giving our students the most complete experience of English that they can get. Okay? Even if we are standing at the front of the classroom, understand that most of the people they will eventually be speaking English to don't sound like us. They might look like some of us, <laughs> but they don't sound like us. Right? So, for that reason, it's important to have a very global perspective of how English sounds and what, English lo what an English speaker looks like to share with our students, okay? Um, now, they mention world Englishes in this definition. Okay, this is where I talk about the distinction. I didn't make a slide for this because I don't want us to get too bogged down in it, but global English is this. It's this paradigm that includes the idea of an English speaker can be anybody and what does that mean, really, okay? Uh, world English, on the other hand, is the idea of English being used, uh, sorry, world English, not world Englishes, these are different. World English is the idea of English being used as the business lingua franca, okay? It is just, it's literally what it is, world English, what, what it says on the tin, 
English is used everywhere in the world. World Englishes is trickier, and we'll talk about that in a second. But World Englishes is the idea that there are many regional variants of English, that there is no one English, there are many different Englishes around the world, and you can't just teach one of them if you want your student to be a well-developed English speaker. Okay, if you only teach your, your student, where are you from? Canada. When we're in Canada. Oh, sorry? Where in Canada? Oh, near Toronto. You're in Toronto. Okay. So if you only teach your students Toronto English, this idea of world Englishes says that you are doing them a disservice because most people don't sound, most English speakers don't sound like a Toronto English speaker. There's no such thing as what most English speakers sound like. So you've got to give your students a broader perspective. Now, how do we do that? Let's talk. You know, she left me this great clicker and I'm not even using it. How does it work? Ah, okay, that's better. All right, so how do we do that? Let's discuss this. Uh, how are we already using global Englishes in our classroom? Think about this. You might already be using global English in your classroom and don't realize. Think about it. Are you? Let's discuss. Okay. Are you? Are you using English from another part of the world? Or are you only using the textbook? Hi, my name is Jenny. What a surprise. Is that you? Is that your, is that your class? No? Okay, then what are you I guess, using? I guess, yeah. Um, I mean, I like making jokes, I like mm -hmm. using idioms, a lot mm -hmm. of expressions. Okay. So any that I've picked up in my lifetime, mm -hmm. so from Canada, mm -hmm. from India, mm -hmm. from friends in mm -hmm. America, or mm -hmm. the States, mm -hmm. I mean, or England, mm -hmm. I guess I would just be incorporating that. Language. Okay, so you're incorporating a lot of global expressions, so different expressions from different English variations. Good, okay. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, I teach a very international group of students. Good. Like Korean students are maybe 20% mm. of the group. Mm -hmm. uh, so the students themselves are the input. Mm. They are coming with all of their varieties. They're quite excellent to begin with. Oh, good. Okay. I give my own examples, but mm -hmm. the students are mostly discussing with each other. Excellent. They're okay. Creating their own sort of very good. Version. Ah, excellent. Very good. Okay, good. That's a really good example. I have a similar situation, although maybe foreign students are 20%, but the foreign students who come usually speak English at a much higher level than the Korean students at my university. So they're bringing in this like very Indian, very Bruneian, very Central Asian English, and the Korean students' minds are blown. Like this is, whoa, 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 hold on. You're not using Kansas English. What's going on? But it's really good for the Korean students because it means that they really have to listen to understand which is great, yeah. So yeah, good example. What else? Anybody else? Think about materials that you're using in class. Yes. I mean, I was gonna say, mm -hmm. maybe on the opposite, this was, uh, mm -hmm. I do a lot of TOEFL stuff. So I do okay. debate primarily with younger students. I okay. do TOEFL with the, upper, or the middle school mm -hmm. students. Okay, and you do TOEFL with middle school students? Oh yeah. Oh wow, okay, I'm impressed. Yeah, um, that's a task. So with TOEFL though, <laughs> mm -hmm. they bring in voice actors to do a lot of the MP3s. Okay. And they'll do, they'll try to do accents mm. and they're very a lot of times you can tell this is not somebody who speaks that accent naturally mm -hmm. um i catch more like the people trying american accents yeah uh, <laughs> and so there, there's an attempt at it but at the same time tofu is very an american test it is very much so and it's so it's it's this weird attempt that it's almost like they're trying to market it mm -hmm. it's more about marketing rather than in introducing global languages yeah and that's an interesting distinction to make i think the idea of a global English is very trendy, but the reality, especially in this part of the world, is that we are still not really looking at how people in different parts of the world actually speak. A lot of our idea of global English is based in stereotype, kind of a stereotypical accent, which we'll talk about in a second. But yeah, definitely. So I think that's a very important distinction. Um, you know what's interesting about that? The TOEFL is, you're right, very much an American test. Has anybody ever taught or taken the IELTS? You might have. Yeah, the IELTS is interesting, isn't it? Because you really do get global English in the IELTS. You get accents from all over the place. They use real sa samples of material uh, from the BBC for the test. So you really do get a broad scope of English, which I really like the IELTS as a test. If my students want to go abroad and their level's quite high, I say take the IELTS, not the TOEFL. You need because the, the IELTS is better. <laughs> but yeah, it's an interesting situation. Anyway, anybody else? Think about the materials that you're using. Yes, many. I use um, uh -huh. TED. Use TED. I'm Good. Very, um, okay. You know, mm -hmm. Different presenters from all over the world. Right. Very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good. Excellent. Okay. Anybody else? I know a lot of us like to teach our students songs, give our students, like, show little videos, show clips of things. Is anybody teaching reading? What are your students reading? Yes. Maybe in my context in Africa, uh -huh. what we use is uh, maybe short stories around. Okay. The okay. Yes. 
around the globe. From now, Africa, okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Excellent. Yeah, that's a really good example as well. Okay. Uh, those of you who are teaching younger learners, do you teach songs? Yes. Where do you? Where are the songs from? Movies. Movies. Aha. Uh huh. Uh -huh. There's like famous Hollywood. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, definitely, yeah. Okay, good. All right, so we're already have, we already have some examples of people using global variants of English in their classroom. Let's talk about this a little bit more. Why are global Englishes useful? Now, this is where we conflate our definition a little bit with world Englishes. There is this great guy whose name has just escaped me. It's in my notes. I'll have to look it up. Braj is his surname. Ah, Kircha is his surname. Braj Kircha. Okay, Braj Kircha, who's a, a very famous linguist. Somebody, somebody in here said that they were doing linguistics. Was that in the previous one? I don't think that person's still here. Okay, famous linguistic, uh, ling linguist, Braj Kircha. And Kircha, he's the guy who's responsible for the whole concept of world Englishes, world Englishes essentially. This is what he made <coughs> up. And he talks a lot about this idea of circles of language, okay? And like who is seen as having the most expertise in a language and who actually actually is capable of communicating in a language. Uh, to, in a nutshell, there's more to it than that. But uh, So we have Kircha, his, he's got these circles of language. The inner circle is the, the countries that we assume have the best English. They, it, the English belongs to them. The US, the UK, Australia, New Zealand. In Korea, we call them the big seven. There's the countries that if you come from them, you can get a visa to teach English, right? Can Canada, etc. Okay, those are the, that's the inner circle. The outer circle is countries that have English as an official language, but it is often not globally recognized as being a valid official uh, source of English language material, like India, Nigeria, Jamaica, okay? Then you have the expanding circle. These are countries that have invested a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of manpower in having English be integrated into the educational curriculum, in producing an English-speaking elite portion of the population. But again, we don't really recognize their English as, being, as having any sort of expertise, like China, Russia, Brazil, okay? Uh, Korea, I think, also belongs in that expanding circle, okay? So, uh, now, the interesting thing about this for me is that, well, let me talk about something else first. Let's first look at representation. Why is it important to use global Englishes? First of all, representation, representation matters. That's such a buzzword. I put it in my abstract for this presentation because everybody likes to say representation matters. Everybody likes kind of the social justice buzzword. Representation matters. What does that actually mean? We don't know because we're just saying it, but representation does matter. If the average English speaker is not a native speaker, and all we are showing our students is native speakers, I think we are doing them a disservice because the person that they are going to be speaking to using their English, no matter how perfectly Oxfordian you teach it to them, if they can understand other speakers of English, why are they learning English? English is a language, right? <laughs> it's for communication now. We know that in reality, English is often also for job searches and tests, but if you have students who are using English as a communicative tool, they need to know how, to, how other people, besides people in the inner circle, speak the language, right? Okay, so that's the first one. Also, they need to see themselves represented in English, okay? I had a, when I first came here, I taught in an elementary school. I was in Gepik, right? And in Gepik, you do a lot of teaching with kids, and you use, I use a lot of videos, a lot of songs, a lot of interactive stuff. And at one point, I had a student say to me, oh, my English is not good because I'm Korean. <gasps> oh, oh, God, really? That's a horrible thing to think. Right? It's not because you're Korean, it's because you don't study. That's different. <laughs> right? But I thought, okay, maybe this kid just needs to see people who look more like them speaking English well. And I went on this bug hunt across the entire internet, and it is so hard to find visual representation of young Asian American people or Asian American kids speaking English well, unless it's in the textbook. Hi, my name is Juhi. What a surprise. Oh, those textbooks drive me nuts, the videos we get with them, <laughs> right? But, so it's really, really hard to find uh, representation. It's really difficult, but I think it's important because students, older students will use it as an excuse. I've had students say things to me like, I cannot pronounce that word because my tongue is thick. <laughs> Really? Right? Oh, didn't you know Koreans have thick tongues? Uh, yeah, really? <laughs> right? Come on, work, work harder. You know, if you're going to give me a stupid excuse, uh, give me a better stupid excuse. <laughs> right? Yeah. 
yeah, exactly. The length of the tongue, the thickness of the tongue. Um, all, all, you get all kinds of strange excuses. But if they can see people who look like them, who, who maybe also have short, thick tongues <laughs> speaking English well, it removes that excuse, right? Um, and I don't, I'm being videoed, so I need to make this clear. I do not actually think Korean people have short, thick tongues. This is just what I've been told, okay? <laughs> now, <laughs> all right. Now, uh, so it's important to have representation. Also, future preparation. I've talked about this already, but who are your students speaking to? Also, who will your students be listening to? The world is moving south and east, isn't it? Right? Um, America is rapidly becoming less of a center of commerce for different reasons. We're moving more into China. We're moving into the South. In 50 years, I think the world will be a very different looking place. And the, who we are speaking to, especially in business, is going to change. If you look at some of the trade agreements happening right now, you can already see the seeds of that being planted. So why are we taking the ability, why are we not implanting in our students the ability to really listen to other Englishes, right? Native English speakers, I have a question for you. If I say German English, you know how that sounds, don't you? Well, yes, you know how that sounds, darling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Right, you know how that sounds, okay? If I say Nigerian English, you know how that sounds, right? It has a sound, right? I'm not going to do that. I'm being recorded. <laughs> right? But if I say Chinese English, that has a sound, right? We as native English speakers already have this encyclopedic knowledge of what global English is sound like. Why are we omitting that from our discussions with our students, from our teaching with our students, right? That is a vital part of how we communicate as native English speakers. Is it not, is it not a tool we need to give to our students as well? Okay. Now, also, it benefits fluency, listening skills, and learning flexibility. There are sources at the end of this PowerPoint in which you can see where I pulled all of this information from. I don't have a lot of time. I don't, actually, I have more than I thought. Oh, that's good. All right, uh, when, is, when am I, I'm finishing at 2.50? Good, okay, good, good, good. All right, um, so benefits fluency, listening skills, and learning flexibility. Uh, there are sources at the end of this PowerPoint that where you can see where I pulled all of this information from. I'm not gonna break every one down bit by bit by bit because it just takes too long. But basically, as far as benefiting uh, listening skills especially, if students are able to listen for meaning and not listen for uh, pre-rehearsed chunks, basically it means that their English is better, right? A lot of our students, especially in the Korean context, they're taught listening by learning how to listen for patterns in native English speaker voices or voices attempting to be native English speaker voices, uh, but they're not actually learning how to listen for words, how to listen for meaning, how to listen for keywords. And those are very critical things that you need to be able to do to have both an elevated level of English language listening and also to be able to understand global variants of English. So that's one of the things it really helps with. Uh, if you are working with students in a listening context, global Englishes can be very helpful. Again, quick story. So I teach cultural studies, which means I teach basically global studies, uh, kind of this Franken course of all of these different elements of what it is to be a global citizen and what's happening in the world. And it sounds very fancy, but really what I do is Tuesday mornings, 9 a.m., I look at a group of very bored undergraduates from all over the world and I say, did you know there are other countries? Really, there are. Okay, good, <laughs> all right. So um, one of the things I do is I like to switch it up on them a lot. I show a lot of videos that have subtitles because my classes are three hours long and nobody wants to hear me talk for three hours and nobody can do group work for three hours. So I show a lot of videos, break it up into chunks and I like to switch it up. And there's a video that I use every semester uh, which is from Jamaica. It's talking about the economic crisis involving farmers in Jamaica. And it's interesting because uh, Jamaica has not only global variants of English, but Jamaican variants of English. There's deep, thick patois, and then there's higher, higher class Jamaicans who almost sound British. All of these exist together in one small island. And in this video, you get the full gamut, right? You get old farmers who are mostly incomprehensible to people who only speak standard English. You get news reporters who speak perfect Queen's Oxford English. You have the whole gamut. And I show this to my students, it has subtitles, and they're following, they're following, they're okay with the news reporter, they're all right, all right, I get it, I get it. And then this old lady comes on and starts to speak in patois, right? And you can just see their faces go, 
what? 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 Right? And this is still English? We don't understand. And then they start reading the subtitles. And then they're starting to kind of match up the words that they do understand with the subtitles and starting to kind of get the sense of it. And then they start asking questions after the video goes off, right? Because they're having to listen in a different way, right? They're having to be flexible in the way that they're learning English, the way that they're understanding English. They're having to listen for the meaning and not just for what they've been taught, right? So it's actually a really useful tool in a lot of ways. Okay, you guys are all sitting here staring at me. I wanna know, where, what do you think about this? Let's talk a little bit. What do you think about this? Now, there's a whole section that, I'm, that I had to cut out that I also wanna bring up really quickly. I, did, I just didn't think I'd have time for it. But the idea of us as native speakers, many of us, especially those who, have, who work in maybe Gepic, Epic, uh, sometimes in Hogwans, have co-teachers, and universities not so much. Uh, but many of us have, would have a co-teacher, and I think it's important also to recognize that your co-teacher is a vital source of global, uh, world English, <laughs> right? Because I think that part of our job as native English-speaking teachers in the public school system is to encourage our uh, English as a foreign language speaking colleagues to speak more in English and to grow and develop those skills, right? Now, not everybody's open to that, <laughs> but if you have a teacher who is sincerely wanting to increase their own English speaking, I think it's important to encourage that and to have the students hear that and see that. Sometimes the students, they'll look at you and say, oh, haha, of course you speak English, you're from another country, right? But if they see their teacher who's from the same country who they've known for much longer than you and will probably know for long after you leave, uh, speak, also speaking English and developing and growing in their English speaking level, that also says a lot to students, I think. Okay, now I'm, I mean it this time, I'm shutting up. What do you think? <laughs> any thoughts, any, any information? Yeah, go for it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I, I love, love the idea and I always mm -hmm. try to do this. Mm -hmm. One mm -hmm. issue is always finding resources because like American English dominates. Of course, or whatever. of course, I yeah. Some mm -hmm. material related to mm -hmm. whatever I'm teaching. Of course. Mm -hmm. um, but the other aspect, even mm -hmm. for me as a native speaker, mm -hmm. each different type of accents mm. I have to learn separately ah interesting like, okay like mm -hmm. I, the ones that I'm very familiar with mm -hmm. I can understand those mm -hmm. immediately but it's because I've listened to them mm. a lot mm -hmm. so trying to teach them world Englishes mm. I feel like it's not just I expose them to one or two mm -hmm. and then they can do all of them oh no not I at all I have to be mm -hmm. teaching them each one mm. like targeted individually mm -hmm. which ends up mm -hmm. taking a whole lot of time understood yeah and to learn one well I'd have mm -hmm. to have a lot of material about that definitely Oh, definitely. And I think, okay, you're, that's a very good point. And I think I need to make it clear. I think at this point and in this context, I think it's more about exposure to the idea of world Englishes, um, more so than trying to teach them actual entire world Englishes. They're going to be learning the American English variant because uh, that's the default here in Korea. That's, that's a given. However, I think it's important to expose them to ideas of English beyond just that, that, that variant. Our students aren't dumb, <laughs> right? If they're interested in something, they'll go ahead and learn, on, learn it more on their own. Um, but I think it's important to expose them to that idea because a lot of them, it doesn't occur to them that just learning perfect English, perfect Kansas English, isn't always going to serve them the best in every context. So I think it's just a matter of exposure personally. That's my thought. I have a student, for example, who uh, has never left Korea, but she has a British accent on purpose. She started out, she's been in a million hagwans and things learning American English uh, and also Korean English, which I think is a developing world English. Um, and then at some point she decided she wanted to have a British accent. She wanted to learn British English and she kind of did that on her own. And it works for her because her native English speaking teachers can understand her just fine. Um, and when she's in context, she's very artistic and she does a lot of art things. So when she's in context where she's with a lot of international people, people roll with it and it's fine. It's caused her problems in school though, <laughs> right? Because of her spelling, for example. Uh, so I think it's just a matter of having, using it as a tool, giving it to students as, as a part of a potential toolbox, not necessarily teaching Chinese English or Singaporean English, because that's, that's impossible, you're right. Mm -hmm. Also, as far as learning, um, individual global Englishes ourselves. Uh, yes, I think that is definitely an issue as well, but it's also a matter of just ex expanding our own exposure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. 
I actually took a class in mm -hmm. grad school about mm -hmm. the world language. So Good. I, I know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. and I like that idea. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, mm -hmm. I think that's from the idea of mm -hmm. that, like native speakers. Mm -hmm. It isn't. Like you mm -hmm. said, native speaker, they can mm -hmm. identify mm -hmm. where this language from and where mm -hmm. this guy from. Like mm -hmm. that. They can't, but actually. He just said. I mean, like, <laughs> the list that you can say that mm -hmm. oh, this is not from where I am mm -hmm. or this is not from mm -hmm. America or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. but, uh, and second language or mm -hmm. language learner mm -hmm. or non native mm -hmm. English teacher, mm -hmm. if you don't know about the certain variety of English, mm -hmm. then you can't really identify that mm -hmm. it's from like mm -hmm. where. Right. I mean, I can open mm -hmm. up. I can open mm -hmm. up by showing some YouTube video mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. I won't stop it. But mm -hmm. the thing is, my mm -hmm. student would feel the same thing that I felt before. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, what is he talking about? Mm -hmm. Have no idea mm -hmm. of what's going on. Mm -hmm. And especially when you're learning language. Mm -hmm. Like having a lot of variety mm -hmm. is really tough to deal with. Oh. I disagree. <laughs> okay, but I, I will explain why. I think you have a really um, good point, but I disagree. I think part of part, I'll give you a couple of reasons why. Um, so before I came here, I taught English in the UK. And at my English course that I taught at in the UK, we had people, we had myself, who was clearly not from the UK. We had people who had Northern English accents, Southern English accents. We had people from Scotland, from Ireland, all teaching in the same course. And because the students were exposed, and our students, a lot of them didn't speak any English at all when they first came. Because they were exposed to such a wide variety, the brain is a very adaptable thing. They were, they were able to roll with it, right? They were able to learn this English and just had to roll with it. Now, they were in an immersion situation, which is different. I do give you that. But not all English speakers automatically recognize where an accent is from. The skill isn't so much in, oh, that person is from Nigeria. Let me flip my brain into perfect Nigerian English so I can understand them. It's more of just having the tools to understand an English that is not familiar to you. It's about the flexibility, the learning flexibility, knowing that this isn't familiar, but it is something I know something about. How can I figure this out? Okay, now that's a cognitive process that has a lot of other uh, ingredients to it. But also world English is, isn't just for native speakers because native speakers don't speak world English as well. We do and we don't. Um, but most people who speak English don't speak English as, like a native speaker does, but still need to have the ability to understand each other. And that happens quite naturally. I observe a lot uh, with my students. The students will speak English with each other who are from different countries, will speak English with each other a lot more readily than they will with me because they think, oh, a native English speaker. Scary, she's judging me. But with each other, it's the only language they have to speak with each other in, and they need to communicate. So they adapt pretty quickly. Again, it's just about developing those tools of flexibility. And finally, uh, the same thing I said to you, it's not so much about teaching an entire new variant of English, or even saying to your students, you must understand every single word of this thing that I'm giving you from another country. It is just about exposing them to the tools, saying there is more to English than just this one variation, and it's important that you know that for your development as an English speaker. I like to challenge students with things that I know that they don't know yet, just to give them an idea of where they're going. Like maybe you might give them a, a little, uh, t sorry, my jacket's coming apart here. Maybe you might want to give them a little taste of uh, something that is way above their level and then go back into something that they know. That switch up, like I said, the brain is a very flexible thing. Right? That switch up, I think, sometimes can help to motivate the students who are very motivated, who are higher level, who maybe are a little bit bored with what's going on in the book, but want to know where this is going to take them. Or students who might not be interested in learning English the way it is, might think, oh, I don't understand this, this is weird, but now I understand what else we're doing. <laughs> right? There's a lot of different um, applications for it just in a classroom setting. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to say is that language is a river, not a rock. It evolves, even within the language itself. Uh, I've had situations here. So I went to the Polyglot Conference uh, last a couple weeks ago. The Polyglot Conference is a conference for multilingual people. Uh, you go and you get to be with people who are all very dedicated to the learning of language and the speaking of languages that are not their native language together. Right? It's a really interesting experience. It was in Fukuoka a couple weeks ago. If you ever get the chance to go, go. It's great. Okay. Now, I speak a couple of other languages, but I'm also learning Korean very slowly and very badly. <laughs> right? But something I've noticed, even within a language that has a relatively small number of native speakers, like Korean, is that it changes quickly. And no matter how perfectly I learn the stuff in the book, I've got to be able to adapt. And, that's the, and with English, that has a much greater number of speakers, those adaptability skills are important. And this, even if you're not teaching 
Today we will learn Jamaican English. Even if you're not doing that, just giving them the idea that there's more out there and that you know, there's a flexibility that they have to have is really important, I think. Mm -hmm. Anyway, but I think you have, good, you have a good point, definitely. But I just think about it differently. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Another perspective. Oh, mm -hmm. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think the word linguistic idea mm -hmm. is like, if you're speaking only one variety, which is the, the known country, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm then actually you end up by not understanding with other people. Right, exactly. And that actually happens quite a lot, I find, with uh, speakers who have been, who've taken a very isolationist approach to their learning. Uh, this is just very anecdotal. I don't have any evidence for this. This is just something I've experienced. But who have taken this very sort of isolationist approach, like I will learn English perfectly from the book. They speak English perfectly well, but they don't listen to it at all. <laughs> And I think we've all met people like that probably, right? So it's just a matter of just increasing the toolbox, just giving them better tools. You know, if you, all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Same with language. If all you have is American English, well, maybe if you meet a guy from India, you're thinking, oh, he doesn't speak English, but he does, <laughs> right? Okay, anyway, sorry, you had something to say? Yeah, I just wanted mm -hmm. to say that um, mm -hmm. I had a very similar experience. In, I'm learning Korean now, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, my teacher, my first day in class, mm -hmm. I was like, what is this man speaking? I've been in Korea for six years, mm -hmm. and I can't understand him at all. Mm -hmm. So I recorded him, mm -hmm. right? I recorded him, and mm -hmm. um, I played it to my students. Mm -hmm. And it was like, Muslim Maria. <laughs> like, of know, course, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. That's my Korean teacher. Mm -hmm. So it's like, even in Korea, the languages mm -hmm. vary, depending mm -hmm. on where you come from. Very much so. Yeah, Saturi um, is a thing. <laughs> right. English yes. Uh -huh. is serious. Mm -hmm. And... Um, as relates to English, mm -hmm. my students sometimes when they hear TED presentation from mm -hmm. all over the world, mm -hmm. and um, before that, they are even afraid to speak up mm -hmm. in class because, like, I don't sound like mm -hmm. this or I don't sound like mm -hmm. what I want to sound like. Mm -hmm. But when they hear, when they are exposed to different um, mm -hmm. accents, English all over the world, mm -hmm. they can understand that even my English is semi unique. Mm -hmm. in yeah, exactly. So mm -hmm. They're not afraid to speak up. Exactly. You get a lot of students who are very self conscious. They're like, oh, I can't speak English, I have an accent. I'm like, you know what an accent is? It's a sign that you can speak more than just English. Good job, keep it up, right? But the, you know, I've, again, that's not necessarily the prevalent way that we teach English. We kind of teach it with the sort of native speaker supremacy, which I was trying not to get into in this pre presentation, but here we are, <laughs> right? With the sort of native speaker supremacy, which can be limiting to students who feel like they have to sound a certain way to speak English well, rather than they have to be able to speak well uh, to, to express themselves well using the rules and the grammar and the vocabulary of a language. They think it's all about a sound, which is how you get people who speak great but don't hear at all. Um, I was telling you guys about the polyglot conference and I skipped ahead and didn't actually get to my point. So it's in Fukuoka. It's in a different place every year. Next year it's in Mexico. So this year it was in Fukuoka. But one of the things I noticed is that uh, I had a lot of chances to speak Korean with people who can speak Korean but did not live in Korea. And I had the most mystifying conversation with an older woman who spoke Korean, but she was, uh, what's the word, Zainichi Korean? Uh, that's what they call it in, in, in Japan, but what's the word for it in Korean? I don't remember, do you know? Yeah, the... Yeah, yeah, like the... the mm -hmm, yeah. Jail? Yeah, yeah, the jail, the Korean people who live in, who have lived in Japan for some time. Right? which is a whole different situation. Look it up if you don't know anything about it. It's very interesting. But when I'm talking to this older woman who is this, who's been living in Japan for, for generations at this point, and my Korean's not that good, and her Korean was so different from everything I've learned that I don't know what she was saying to me. I was just, they, they. Because my flexibility hasn't been tuned because I've only ever heard the variant of Korean that I'm familiar with, or I've only ever learned one variant of Korean. I haven't really been exposed to a lot of other variants, except for through just being in Korea, which is not necessarily enough. Nobody's ever sat me down and said, hey, you know what, there are different ways to speak Korean. Right? even within, again, a relatively small population of native speakers. And I've had the same situation with Chinese Korean speakers, where I'm just like, wow, you to you, your vocabulary is totally different than what I thought I knew. They're easier to understand than this lady was. But again, it's just a matter of tool, tools, you opening up your flexibility. Um, okay, I'm gonna, we only have a few minutes left. I'm gonna go to my last, my last couple of slides here. Finding materials. I didn't answer your question or talk to you about this before because I was gonna talk about it in a whole big thing. You're right, it's hard to find materials. Native speaker supremacy is a thing. Like I said, I'm not getting into that today. We're 
moving positively, not negatively. Something I want to say really quickly, while I was doing research for this, I noticed something interesting within the literature, and that is that um, I don't know why this is, but think about this. It's very, uh, the, re so the prevalent research on this is very negative. And when I say negative, I don't mean in a moral or social sense, I mean in a quantitative sense or qualitative sense. Uh, I'm not sure which one of those applies here. What I mean is that a lot of the studies are done in terms of, mm, we looked at 700 textbooks in Japan and we didn't find any English speakers from these following, from the following countries. It's more about what people are not finding rather than what we are adding and testing and introducing, which I think is really strange <laughs> compared to the way that academia usually works. So if anybody has an idea for a positive study, let's use a test population, introduce this element of world English, do it because there's a need for it. Maybe you can get some funding. I don't have time, but <laughs> somebody else should do that, definitely. Anyway. Teaching and pedagogy. Global English is great as far as just getting more information about the teaching, the pedagogy, why this is relevant, how this is relevant, how we can use it. There's a lot of articles, a lot of things to read. Uh, the people that I mentioned before who run the Global English's website basically wrote, well, literally wrote the book on Global Englishes. This is what they do. <laughs> okay, so there's a lot of resources that they have created specifically for teachers who are looking at introducing this concept. Um, for young learners, Sesame Street. Remember when I told you before I went on this bug hunt looking for like Asian faces who were speaking native speak who were speaking native English and I couldn't find it except for like fresh off the boat which is not really a great example for kids. All right. Um, Sesame Street was where I finally found it. And even the Sesame Street clips were quite old. I'm very surprised at how few Asian American children or Asian Canadian children you see in children's television programming in the West. I, wasn't, I didn't even see it in Australia, which I really expected, except for that one guy from the Wiggles, and I don't even think he's in there anymore, <laughs> right? Uh, those of you who don't teach young learners have no idea what I'm talking about. It's okay, have a kid. Uh, anyway, so, <laughs> right, Sesame Street is great. Yo Gabba Gabba is another one. They've got songs, and the good thing about Yo Gabba Gabba is that it also gets in into variations of English within native speaking English. So you'll get Mexican English. You'll get uh, AAVE, African American Vernacular English. You'll get uh, all sorts, you'll get country kind of like Southern accents. You'll get different English accents. Uh, sorry, how do I phrase this? Ah, that's it. Different world Englishes or different English variations within the within native speaker worlds. This is very hard to phrase. I'm so conscious of this camera, sorry. <laughs> right. So there's that. Um, also, We Bear Bears is, is very popular here. I think a lot of you have probably seen this. One of the bears is Korean, it's very cute. And they, have, they also show the code switching between um, English and other languages very smoothly within We Bear Bears. So you'll have somebody's mom who will talk to their kid in their first language, which is Korean or Spanish or Swahili, and then they'll switch and talk to their friends in English. I think that's important for our students to see if they're young learners. The idea that you, you can speak more than one language and do it smoothly. It, speaking one language doesn't erase all your other languages, which is a very real fear I notice in a lot of places, and it's not necessarily a necessary one. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. The government policy a while ago, they didn't want to teach English mm -hmm. under grade three because it had damaged them. They did, reading. and it was so wrong. Mm -hmm. It really was, because all of the prevalent research says the younger you start learning, the better you integrate your languages as you get older. I don't think the people who made that government policy had ever met a person from Nigeria or Uzbekistan. Have you ever met a Nigerian or an Uzbek? They speak like, yeah, yeah, they speak about 10 languages completely easily. And it's because they start learning when they're six months old, right? And it, they integrate it really, really seamlessly when they get older. It's a shame that that happened. But yeah, exactly, which is, sorry, go ahead. They reversed it. They did, which is great. So it's a blessing that they reversed it. Anyway, uh, so there's other educational television clips. There are so many young learner examples of different Englishes, especially coming from the US and the UK, uh, that it's actually quite easy to find supplemental materials for young learners. And the good thing about materials for young learners is that they don't, they're not particularly on the nose a lot of times. They usually present it in a fairly natural way. Whereas when you get into stuff for older, for older people, a lot of times it's like, look, diversity. We have diversity. Do you see the diversity? <laughs> right? We don't want that necessarily. I don't want that personally. I think it's awkward to introduce issues of diversity or world Englishes into class that way. But you do find that in some of the materials meant for, uh, particularly for teens, older teens. 
but for young learners, it's pretty, it's pretty easy to find these things. Just look at Sesame Street. I love Sesame Street. It's great for this. Orange Muppets can speak English, so your students can. That's the way I always think about it. For middle and high school learners, it's harder. It's much harder uh, because a lot of the material is either way above their level or way below their level. So it's either too childish in content or too difficult in language. It really is difficult. The only thing I can say here, I'll be honest, I don't have any uh, experience teaching middle school at all, but high school, choose your supplemental materials carefully. Songs work really well. I think I'm almost out of time, okay. Songs work really well. Uh, for adult learners, it's actually much easier in some ways. The world is their oyster, especially if you're teaching adult, uh, like, Older than university, if you're working in a hagwon teaching adult learners, it's great because you can just say, who, who do you talk to that you need to come learn English from me for? Talk to them more, <laughs> right? Or find more things from them. So for example, my friend who goes to China, I say, okay, so go find more examples of people who, can, who speak Chinese who also speak English and listen to them. That's easy for adults. Also, adults tend to be motivated by the need to make money, and that helps. Um, also, don't discount your textbooks. Your textbooks uh, can be annoying at times, but they do often have a token kid who speaks English, and maybe that kid is putting on an, English ac an, uh, an American accent or an English accent, maybe not. They've also often got, uh, they're one of the only sources I have found of Asian people speaking English with an accent that is not offensive. Right, that is not done as like a comedy as a joke thing. You can find that in your textbooks really easily. But a lot of times when you find examples of Asian Englishes, it's played as a joke in a lot of materials and that is difficult to navigate. So textbooks are a good source for serious examples of Asian Englishes without it, yeah, that level of offense. Be selective, as always. I just mentioned offense. This is not a lesson on diversity necessarily, so I'm not gonna talk about it, but just be selective about what you choose. Make sure it's something that is portraying the use of world English as positively. When I first came here, somebody told me I should use mind your language. Do you guys know mind your language? Okay, some of you, yeah, you do. Uh, you're definitely Kenyan. Okay. <laughs> uh, mind your language is this old British TV show that is about an E, uh, I think it came out in the 70s. Am I right, Wayne? Yeah. That is about an EFL classroom within, uh, that's in London. And it is every horrible stereotype you can imagine in one sitcom, right? And it's funny sometimes, but it is very, very offensive by today's standards. And somebody, people will say things like, oh, use, I gotta go. Okay, say things like, oh, use mind your language. Don't do that, be selective. Also, it was really hard to find resources. I spent a lot of time looking. I still spend a lot of time looking. I'm thinking of trying to create my own resource bank online. If you're interested in helping me with that or talking to me about doing that, talk to me later because this is something that is necessary. Let's talk. Let's make a bank. All right, guys. I'm done. I've already talked for too long. But thank you so much for bringing your perspectives and listening to me share a little bit of mine. Have a great day. <laughs> Bye.